So welcome everyone to our Impart Research Wheel webinar. We are delighted about the new webinar series the Impart team is hosting. Before we get started, I would like to introduce, to, introduce it to you all. So the Impart Investigator team is a virtual research institute headquartered at Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick in St. John. Our team is composed of 45 academic clinical partners across eight universities in six provinces, as well as um, 25 community and funding agency members, 15 private sector company representatives, and two provincial government departments. The import mission is to think boldly and utilize our network to improve the outcomes of vulnerable patient populations starting always with innovation developed and tested here in New Brunswick. We apply intersectional thinking between social and medical innovation and have brought together a diverse and inclusive team of experts to support activities from fundamental research to applied interventions with vulnerable populations. So the Research Reels webinar series will, host, will be hosted monthly by the IMPART team investigators and trainees on ongoing and or completed research within the network. The objectives of this webinar series are to improve networking among IMPART team members, enhance opportunities for future collaborations, and support knowledge translation of research findings. So if you would like to nominate a speaker for the uh, research real webinars, please do so in our post-webinar uh, survey, as well you can email us at research at impart.team. So Impart is also present on social media. So please follow us on our social media uh, channels to learn more about any research uh, collaboration opportunities we have. I am beyond excited to introduce you to today's speaker, who is Dr. Paul Atkinson. He is a professor in emergency medicine at Dalhousie University and clinical academic head for emergency medicine uh, at St. John Regional Hospital here in New Brunswick, Canada. He is also deputy editor of the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine and has recently been appointed assistant dean of research at Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick. He is past chair of the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians Research Committee, as well as the NB Trauma Program Research Subcommittee. His international training began at the Queen, Queen's University of Belfast followed by postgraduate programs in internal medicine in Belfast and emergency medicine in Cambridge, UK. He completed a fellowship at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, Australia. He relocated to St. John, New Brunswick from Cambridge in late 2009. He has an outstanding AD peer-reviewed publications as well the, he is the lead editor on three textbooks. Awards include the inaugural Best in Class Undergrad Teaching Award from Dalhousie Medicine, Dalhousie University in 2012, and the National Grant Innes Award of, for Emergency Medicine Research in 2014, and the Ian Steele Researcher of the Year Award from the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians in 2019. Dr. Atkinson is married to Julie, and together they have three young adult offspring. <clears throat> excuse me, Jordan, Lucy, and Jack. Uh, Dr. Atkinson enjoys cycling and hiking to the wide open spaces of New Brunswick and is looking forward to the challenge of leading the emergency medicine team in uh, the St. John area. Now I'll pass the floor to the speaker itself. Thank you so much. Um, what a welcome. It, uh... I'm not sure how to follow that, to be honest. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, when you hear about yourself, sometimes you don't recognize yourself, but that's, that's, that's great. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, you uh, may notice that my accent is a little bit uh, international. And um, as Natalia has pointed out, um, I, I, I hail from the northern part of Ireland and then have trained around the world. And in fact, I thought that might be a good theme for this short talk, this short presentation. 
So it's a real pleasure to be going um, early on in this series of research reels, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so I guess what I was trying to think, well, what do you focus in on? I was asked to focus in on some current or relevant research. And so in emergency medicine, we are generalists. And even in my role as assistant dean at DMNB, um, there's quite a broad range of research interests that one could talk about. So I thought what I would try to do is really think about for younger researchers or people starting out um, or even those leading a program, you know, where do you want to get to in your research career and how do you get there? And what we'll do is I'll maybe give you a little bit of my journey and how I progressed along the way. And we can take some questions and answers. So having a vision is important. In other words, a destination, where you want to be, where you put your effort into to getting to. And um, so a vision is the horizon. But of course, the strategy is how to get there. It's the road, it's the map, it's the path that you have to take to get there. And so being focused is important, but what do you focus on? Where do you start? Do you scan the horizon or do you look right in front of you? And I think for me, what was most important was to start with a question that I wanted to answer to start with something that was relevant to where I was at the time, perhaps a clinical question, a systems question, because really that's what's going to inspire you to put the effort in to create a research question and then follow through and get towards the vision of where you want to be. Now, I have deliberately chosen some uh, projects that really were low cost that I managed to... Uh, involve myself with or lead or deliver during my career without any major grants. And for sure, yes, later in my career, I've been lucky to be part of some CIHR grants and, and bring in some money and funding and get positions. But really, uh, the, the barriers were not so much money for any of these projects. They were really just about time, effort and focus. And so I'm going to start right back at the beginning in Belfast, Northern Ireland. This is Queen's University. And so my very first project that um, actually led me to, to, to end up presenting this in Canada at a conference um, relates to a project around telemedicine and cardiopulmonary resuscitation and the value of video link and telephone instruction to a bystander. So the idea being that this was back, if, you, if the date is not on here, this was in 1999. And the idea was that using a telephone, either with, with, with audio instruction or a video link, could you actually um, guide somebody, a bystander with no training in CPR to deliver CPR training in a, in a simulated environment um, to a standard that was similar to someone who, who had training. And um, the answer is that, that video link instruction um, can actually produce significant improvements in the quality of CPR in mock resuscitations for people with no training. Now, remember, this was before the iPhone. This was back whenever um, this was the kind of phone that people had in, the, in their hand. And so this was a little bit visionary and, and trying to set the scene for telemedicine and digital health. And I think we're now only sort of you know, 20 years later or so, or 25 years, approaching 20, 22, 23 years later, we're getting to the point that some EMS systems are starting to use this technology. But this all came from a simple question because we were seeing people being brought in who had had poor quality CPR. Was there technology that could help us? And it was set up in a simulated environment in an emergency department, collaborating with partners. Moving on into Cambridge during my initial training, um, I started to get very involved in ultrasound, bedside ultrasound, point of care ultrasound. And so um, one of the questions that we were asking then was around, should we be using ultrasound for placing a central venous catheter or a central line? Because if you imagine this, this is, um, you know, if for those of you who are non-clinical, this is placing a a large bore catheter, a long needle into somebody's neck or groin, into a vein blindly, not really knowing what the anatomy is. There's variable anatomy. And unfortunately, the complications could be quite severe, causing pneumothoraces, causing arterial puncture, 
And so I, I wondered, well, here we have an ultrasound machine, shouldn't we be using that? And so this led us to um, look at the literature around the use of this in the emergency department. And this methodology was not lab-based, this was a systematic review. And in fact, we found that there was very, very strong evidence and were one of the first groups back in 2005 sort of to publish that we should be doing this and it's now routine. So that is again, a clinical question, seeing something that goes wrong, wondering if this tool should help, finding the evidence, gathering it together with the team and publishing this. Now, I did have the pleasure of spending a year in Australia, in Sydney, what a wonderful city. Um, and while I was there, um, you, you, you get exposed to a whole different variety of, of um, clinical presentations and envenomation was one of those things. So they have snakes, they have spiders, they have all sorts of things in the water that would scare you off as well as sharks. But one of the interesting things was how to treat some of this. And so they have um, a lot of marine envenomations. And, and, and I wanted to pose the question because I'd heard anecdotally that putting warm or hot water on these things would help. And so again, this inspired me along with a group of others to ask the question, um, does hot water immersion um, help to treat marine envenomation? And again, this came from a local um, experiential case series of treating a, a number of patients with this approach that seemed to work. Um, there was a local study that I was then an assistant for as a resident um, where we trialed this out on the beach front line and it seemed to work. And then that led me to again do a systematic review of the literature and found that there was growing evidence, including some of the research we had done in Sydney. And we were able to put together this um, systematic review on that topic. Then back to Cambridge, um, more ultrasound questions. So ultrasound seemed to be keep coming up. And here I had a case where I had a patient who came in in cardiac arrest. He was a young man. He was, uh, uh, CPR was delivered. His ECG showed asystole, but then ultrasound was involved and seemed to show some movement. And, and it was very confusing. And in the end, this, this gentleman actually survived and went home. And so we were starting to ask the question, does echo or bedside ultrasound add value over just your standard tracing on an ECG um, to, to predict outcomes in cardiac arrest? So is it feasible? Does it add information? And so this is one of our first prospective studies. We were able to do a diagnostic test study, again, with a group of people across um, you know, internal medicine, um, as well as, as, as emergency medicine. And, and we published this and it was one of the first papers again, um, and now incorporated into a, 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 another body of evidence saying that ultrasound can be useful in cardiac arrest. And then on to St. John, where I've been for the last sort of 11 years. And really that uh, I wanted just to highlight, and we've done lots of research here, but here we started to really take that body of work around point of care ultrasound. And we created what we call a shock research group, sonography and hypotension and cardiac arrest, and really began to build on the early successes of diagnostic studies, case series. And, um, and, and we built to the point that we were able to deliver several studies here. And in the map at the top, you can see the the um, impact of, of the shock network with, with um, contributions to research studies from many countries right across the world, based here, uh, and a team based in St. John, New Brunswick. But I think what this led to, again, we're starting to build higher level studies where we did one of the first multi-center RCTs looking at point of care ultrasound in shock. And then subsequent to that, two systematic reviews published in resuscitation, answering questions again, such as what is the benefit of ultrasound in a cardiac arrest? How can ultrasound be useful in shock? And finally, that led to even a set of international guidelines um, based upon this work known as the shock guidelines um, for the use of ultrasound in, in, in cardiac arrest and hypotension, which has been published by the International Federation for Emergency Medicine. So those small early questions that one has right in front of you, whether it's um, a question in a lab or, or a patient, 
can lead you to a form of inquiry that you can build into a program of research that can lead eventually with determination um, to a full program and hopefully knowledge translation and impacting practice. And so really what I wanted to do with this slide is just say that the impact of this, when I look back at this, at each time you're doing one small study, you're, you're one larger study you're building, but when you look back and see where this work has been cited or incorporated and you find that some of this has been incorporated by the American Red Cross, the American Heart Association, papers are cited and up to date. Um, there are reviews in the BMJ or New England Journal that, that cite your work. You start to feel that, you know, from very small beginnings of a, of a resident or a student project, one can build a program that is actually very low cost but can have an impact. And that's what I want to encourage people to have that vision to impact care around them. And so really you can do that here at Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick. We have a research program. We can help support, we can be the soil for roots to grow. We can connect people. We involve, um, there are undergrads, postgrads, residents and faculty, and we have support for all of this and we can align there are and programs of support through, through DAL, as well as, of course, through IMPART, our virtual um, institute. And so I think what's important is that we, we're able to share, we're able to network, and together we can be much more than we can as any individual. Collaboration is the way forward, especially here in New Brunswick. We must get away from our silos, we must link, we must create teams, and we must link those teams into teams of teams, because that's how we're going to succeed in research. Ideas are born from connections, and I'll finish on this theme because uh, time is tight, but if the, one of the um, amazing changes to um, inquiry and, and the development of enlightened thinking came in the switch in um, around the time of the enlightenment, late medieval England, when people stopped well, didn't stop, but moved from just congregating in pubs and drinking, drinking alcohol and the opening up of the coffee shops. And so rather than dulling their brain with alcohol, they stimulated their brain with, with coffee during the day when they were awake and they started to spend time together. And those coffee shops led to, to conversations and, and to many of the great scientific breakthroughs. So while one remembers the great scientists, what often we forget are the connections and those around them that very few papers are published with one name and that networks connections will help get us towards that vision of making a difference and impacting um, care around us. But do remember that even while Rome wasn't built in a day, certainly modern cities are not built in a day. This is the progression of New York and research programs aren't built in a day. So don't be uh, disappointed. Don't be exasperated when in fact it takes time and effort. Continue, persevere, work with those around you, collaborate, and you will achieve that vision. So um, thank you for your time. I know this is brief, but I just thought that that might be a useful introduction or a high level talk on how, you know, having a vision, but starting with a simple question in front of you can help you move forward in your research career. So thank you for your time.